Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, there are thousands of acres to explore and lots of animals to see. Uh, one of the biggest attractions we have here uh, wildlife-wise are our American alligators. We're taking a tour of Nyaka River State Park. And nope, that isn't an underwater plant. We're getting up close to some unique marine animals. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes, I'm Marcia Panucci. It's one of the largest and oldest state parks in Florida. Mayaka River State Park offers visitors lots of activities and the park offers animals of refuge. There's a lot of attractions that draw people to this park. From miles of hiking and biking trails, to venturing to new heights on the canopy walkway. This park has something for every adventure level. Welcome to Mayaka River State Park. Uh, this is one of the largest, one of the oldest, and one of the busiest state parks in the state of Florida. Running through the close to 40,000 acres is the Mayaka River. The river is found on the west coast of Florida and flows through three counties, all the way out to the Gulf of Mexico. We have two large lakes here and we have, they have a ton of food. So it's a perfect habitat for them to call home just based off of the food and the amount of space that they have. Yes, getting out on the water is a must, but you won't be alone. Uh, one of the biggest attractions we have here uh, wildlife wise are our American alligators. Um, and we have a lot of them here right on shore right now. Now uh, I'm gonna start paddling over to them. But obviously when you start paddling out on the river, uh, something important to keep in mind, uh, especially around alligators, is just to keep your distance. It's, 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 it's cool that uh, you want to get up close and see them, and, it's, and it, we encourage taking pictures and things like that, but it's just uh, one of the important things to keep in mind is you just don't want to get too close because you don't want to harass the alligators. This Florida State Park is a refuge to many other animals too, and the park is full of history as well. What I really want for you to do today is I want you to think of yourselves as early Florida pioneers. You've come out here to Mayaka to settle, and there's a few questions you want to ask yourselves. Like, first of all, where would I build a cabin? What would I use to build that cabin? How will I provide for my family? And what kind of food are we going to put on the table? Hopefully, by the end of the tour, these are questions you're going to be able to answer. Can you share with us the early history of this park? How long has it been here? Well, it's been here for quite a while. Um, it was originally started back in the 30s. Um, a lot of our structures that we still have today were built by the uh, Citizen Conservation Corps or the CCC back from the uh, New Deal project after the Depression. So we have President Roosevelt to say thank you to at we this do. point. <laughs> and so then this was developed as a park and mm -hmm. I, we know that it's approximately 37,000? It's approximately 37,000 <laughs> acres, yeah. give or take. And so how do the animals find their way? I mean, you don't put signs up. No, we don't put yeah. signs up. <laughs> um, if you go out into our trail system, um, you'll see a lot of animal paths. These animals have been here for years and generations, and they know better than we do where they're going. So would you say then they come from the interior of Florida and somehow find their way? Because we are on the west coast of Florida. We are on the west coast. Um, a lot of our animals um, in this area don't really travel to this park. They, they grow up here. Um, being that we have so much acreage, we have so much area for them to enjoy and be animals. You are the park ranger. What is it that you hold dearest to your heart about this park? Just the fact that we have the habitat. Habitat is increasingly hard to come by in Florida, and the fact that we have this big chunk of acreage set aside for um, the visitors to come out and enjoy and the animals to be the animals that they were meant to be. Parks are important places to have in your neighborhood. They promote physical activity. They usually have some fun playgrounds and they help with air quality. When we have parks, that usually means lots of trees, which can help minimize air pollution. And let's not forget, parks provide natural habitats for many different animals.
This is Tez, and he's a Belgian Malinois. And what we are going to learn today is how important it is to teach a dog to stay. And the importance of that is mostly so that if he is outdoors and he gets away from you, it is very important that you can make him stay still in case of oncoming traffic. We don't want him running off. We want him to know sit and we want him to know stay. So we're going to work on this today. He's been doing it a little bit. So he has some practice, but it's still a work in progress. And of course, it's something that if you really want it to be perfect, you want to keep practicing. You have to be consistent in all of your training. So first, we would kind of lure him around with a treat. Taz, come. He, he does his sit. Well, tell him sit, and you can give him a treat. Did we lose it? Come back. Here. Right here. Sit. Good. Now you can do it right from here. I sometimes prefer to tell them down, down. Okay. And then say, stay. When you're first starting a stay, you only just want to go a step. Say, good boy. And you wait. And then you could go back and give them a little treat and teach them that it's okay. Some people, oh, I dropped one, <laughs> apologize. Will actually also just, if they're sitting, say, stay and then kind of take a step and give them the treat and bring it in front of where you want their nose to be staying. Say, so stay, and you take a step, and he should stay there for you. Good boy, good boy, always praise. Good boy, stay and take a step. Also, if you notice, when I'm taking the step, I try to go with the leg furthest away from him because sometimes, and I don't really have every, an explanation as to why, but for sometimes I've noticed with dogs, if you go to the one that's closest, they tend to follow you. So I always kind of tell them, wait, stay, and then I take a step away. Now, if you have a dog that's really not wanting to leave your side, you can first teach them to just kind of be patient. So you would give them a treat, stay, and then you could just stand right there in front of them, but start counting, and maybe count to five if you could get that far. And as long as they hold still, and they don't jump up, they don't move around, you give them another treat. And then slowly stay, and just take one step and see if they can handle being there for a minute. Now, of course, whenever you teach any kind of training cue, you want them to have a release cue so that they know. So if I say stay, and I'm stay, now when I want them to come to me, I say, come on, Tess, good boy, good boy. So you can either say okay, or come, or here, something that they know, okay, I can release now. I like to really kind of make my hand the stay be real, like let them really see it clearly. The reason why is, so this way, God forbid, if your dog runs off, and you see a car coming, and you want from a distance. You want them to know. It's almost like telling somebody, stop. You know, you want them to know, don't move. And you hold your hand up there. And that way, they hopefully, if you've done it well, and they really understand it, they will trust you. They will stay there until you give them the release code, which would be, OK, here you go. This isn't your typical iguana. This guy is critically endangered native to only two islands in the world. We'll learn about him next. Many active duty servicemen and women face a dilemma as they prepare for deployment. Who will look after their canine companion until they return? Dante's Den provides temporary boarding for their dogs as they serve. We honor the trust placed in us by members of the armed forces by giving their furry friends loving care, spacious dens, on-site veterinary care, and plenty of room to run and play. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. People have asked me what it'll cost to restore all the corals back the way they remember. I have to ask them, what will it cost if we don't do anything?
This is a Cayman Island iguana. They're found only on two islands, and they may even be extinct on one of those two. Oh. They are critically endangered. Uh, this is a Cayman Island rock iguana, Cyclura caymanensis, or Cyclura nubila caymanensis, depending upon whose categorization you want to follow. And uh, Antonio is very used to being handled. He loves to be out. He loves to be with people. He will actually come just run over and seek you out, and he'll tap you on the leg when he wants to be picked up. <laughs> um, the rock iguanas are very dog-like. Now, again, the issue of do they make good pets? Well, they can make wonderful pets, but they require significant commitment on your part to space and so on. But these are critically endangered species. These are animals that require permits. These are animals that require a lot of different things. And uh, there are very few of these in captivity that are pure. Uh, but you can them... see he's camouflaged beautifully. Oh, yeah. Beautifully. Oh, yeah. You get him in by the Ironshore Rock where they live, and they easily disappear. He's a boy. The boys are quite a bit larger than the girls when they're full grown. And when he's full grown, he will be about four foot two, four foot three when he's, when he's all the way up there. Now, tell us about that tail. That looks like a, a real weapon. It really isn't. Um, an adult might use it to try to scare somebody off. Uh, the worst it can do is sting a little bit. But like all iguana lizards, the, uh, the tail can break. Ah. There's a certain amount of fragility. And even though part of it grows back, it never looks the same afterward. Uh, really, really hurts their appearance and their feelings. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> but he seems like he's got a personality. Oh. Am I reading these, that right? No, these guys have a, an incredible personality. Um, one of the gals who works with me one of our volunteers, and she's been raising a number of these, a number of our babies. Uh, you, you would not believe the stuff she gets them to do. You think the dogs are clever? You should see these guys. It's amazing what they were able to do. Now, what are we looking at right here on the side? There's an indentation. Mm -hmm. Looks That's like his an eardrum. I was going to say, it should be an ear. They have an external eardrum, yep. And when they get close to shedding, they, they shed in pieces, unlike a snake that sheds all at once. Mm -hmm. When they get close to shedding, they can't hear as well. And the shedding occurs when? When we don't know? Whenever Mother Nature decides to do it. <laughs> um, on the old adult animals, it happens maybe two, three times a year at the most. On the younger ones, it could happen once a month. But again, with these guys, it's pieces. So I guess you could make a good pet. Oh, they, as I said, they're very dog-like. Uh, they're wonderful animals, and they have uh, very little relationship to the green iguanas that have taken over southern Florida. Well, you're so homely, you're adorable. Yes! See? See Did what you thinks? see that? <laughs> what, I what, he was, what he was doing was tasting, <laughs> tasting the air. Yeah, uh, I, I said, you're so homely, you're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> One of the main culprits that could lead to the extinction of the Cayman Island iguana, habitat destruction. That's right. One of the biggest causes of their decline is development. Stay with us, more Animal Outtakes is coming up next. All right, crew, let's get started. Sure. Don't ignore the law. You must call 811 at least two to three days before any digging project so you can avoid hitting our essential buried utilities. For digging projects big or small, make the call to 811. The following message is brought to you by Mesobook.com. People who have been diagnosed with mesothelioma have many questions. How did I get this disease? What are my treatment options? How will this affect my loved ones? You need answers, which is why we offer a free book written by medical professionals who have treated mesothelioma. Call toll-free at 1-800-777-1366 or go to mesobook.com. They're a marine animal, 
They come in a wide variety of colors and they can sting and they feel like jello. We're learning more about sea anemones. Well, it's feeding time, right? Yes, it is. Lunch yes. time it is. And we're here with some gorgeous, gorgeous creatures. Some of them, I don't even know what they are, but I can see the starfish. Yeah, there's sea stars. Star there's one right up top here. The sea anemones are also getting fed. Now they're gonna filter out their food with their sticky tentacles there. And what Katie's feeding here is a mixture of krill and plankton and sometimes just sort of a, a squishy mix of deliciousness. And there you go, see well, how the arms he's are closing He's in? enjoying that. He and is. you know, when we look at these or we see these in pictures, we have a tendency to say, oh yeah, that's a nice picture, right. but we don't realize this is a living creature. It absolutely is. If you think of a jelly that you kind of flipped upside down, mm -hmm. that's what an anemone is. They have some very mild stinging cells on their arms that are called nematocysts, mm -hmm. and that just helps them capture their food. Now, if you want, reach in there gently with your two fingers and just feel those arms. Right they feel in a little here? stickiness. Here? Yeah, just a nice soft touch. And oh, you might just kind of so cling gentle. to it. gentle. Oh. It's like touching water because they're about 90% water, their bodies Does are. he or she know I'm doing this? <laughs> they're aware. They can certainly feel that you're touching can they them. Feel and it? they may respond by closing up uh -huh. just for protection. There you go. And if we look over here, we can see a sea star. Yes. And if you'd like to do likewise there, oh, we'll touch him real gently. I would. What's on the end of the tentacles? Yeah, if you look really close under the arms of the sea stars, they have tube feet. Tube feet are how sea stars get along. They actually have a pump in their body that pumps water in those tube feet and back out through a top plate called the madrepore. In any case, it helps them move about locomote and they also capture their prey that way because when they get a grip on something like a clam they don't let go and that clam eventually opens up and then guess how they eat you and i put food in our stomachs yes and sea stars they put their stomach in the food oh my the stomach turns inside <laughs> out goes inside say a clam and digest that clam and then comes right back inside and the where sea star. is his tummy all of that's up inside up inside here inside the sea star now granted, we can't see that now and I don't want to lift him because he's got a good grip on that shelf. And we want to respect him, plus he's getting ready to have some lunch. Well, yeah, absolutely, we don't want to. I don't want to be flipped over no, and have my no, stomach no, exposed. but here we go, here we go. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Haley is showing us exactly what's happening there. So here's the pump, and that pumps the water through the whole system of the sea star so that those tube feet act like little bellows that like suction cups. Sure. But they're sure. stronger than suction cups because they're actually pumping water. That's one of my most fascinating systems when it comes to animals. I was so excited to learn about that as a marine biologist. It's, it's really fascinating how they work. And then they're covered in these tubercles that makes them strong, sort of like reduced urchin spines because they're all related. And if you flip them over, that's where you see those two feet. Sure. It feels a lot like the real thing. But you know what? It's very unfortunate because as we go into souvenir shops, yeah. anywhere where in California, Florida, Texas, and so world. on, all over the world, we see them you do, dried you see up. You dried up. Absolutely gone. And they're way I don't better think, alive. I, yes, <laughs> they're, they're much, much more, more beautiful alive. alive. But I do have to ask you a question. As I dipped into there, what temperature is this water? <laughs> yeah. I thought my hand was going to freeze. You're going to find these guys out in our Florida beaches where our water is probably 80 some degrees right now. They Their water is kept in the mid 40s to low ah. 50s. And that's more in in uh, conjunction with what you would find off the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. where that water is really cold. They I are mean, always we're in talking the cold water. very, 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 very cold And you water. see just the variety of animals that live in that cold water these big pink sea stars, there's just a whole variety of them. Like I say, they're facing some really challenges now because when that water starts to warm, they can't just move to a colder environment. And they are so trouble. beautiful and romantic. They are beautiful. It is a fish that's not a fish. They're commonly called starfish. But really, sea stars are more closely related to sand dollars and sea urchins than actual fish. So as I've learned, we need to drop the fish and call them by their more accurate name, sea stars. 
More to come as the vet is next. Did you know you could get life insurance for less than 32 cents a day? With guaranteed acceptance, whole life insurance through True Stage, you can get up to $25,000 in protection with a single phone call. And you cannot be turned down for any reason. Even if you have health problems or are living on a fixed income, guaranteed acceptance whole life insurance policies could work for you with prices starting at less than 32 cents a day. That's as low as $9.40 a month. True Stage can help free your family from immediate financial stress when you're gone. Utility bills, mortgages, car payments, those are a lot of things that can add up pretty fast. My mom didn't have life insurance and the cost all fell on me. And that's expensive. Mm -hmm. we're, we're still paying for yeah, that. Yeah, we're still paying for that. Call 1-800-218-4991. Now, in one phone call, you can help prepare your family with protection amounts up to $25,000. There are no medical tests or health questions. And remember, you cannot be turned down for any reason. In fact, True Stage policies are already protecting over 18 million Americans. And rates are designed to be affordable, starting at less than 32 cents a day. That's as low as $9.40 a month. Plus, your price will never increase and your benefit will never decrease. When I leave, everything will be taken care of for them. Call 1-800-218-4991. Now, for a free, no obligation quote, True Stage offers plans to fit your budget with prices starting at less than 32 cents a day. Help protect your family from immediate financial burdens after you're gone with guaranteed acceptance whole life insurance through True Stage. Call 1-800-218-4991 now. Dr. Glassman, so many of us want to do the very, very best for our pets. And so we have an inclination to say, don't worry, we'll cook. And so, you know, I've come up with a lot of recipes with vegetables and all of this. And at the end of the day, is it really the right thing to do? Probably not. <laughs> Unless you're a board certified veterinary nutritionist then you know how to calculate vitamins and minerals and protein calorie ratios and fatty acids, probably not. And actually uh, homemade diets have been shown to be inadequate. Uh, I've, I had to do a little bit of research for this topic but I'm going to refer to my notes. In my American Veterinary Medical Journal, which is one of our most prestigious journals, we see stuff published on this. And uh, one study showed 94 recipes were studied. None had all the essential nutrients. Oh, that's not and very good. Another study, 200 recipes, 95% had at least one essential nutritional deficiency. And a third study with raw foods, which I'll talk about in a second, yes. raw chicken-based homemade diets, 80% had salmonella. So, that's a myth about that raw food, is yeah, it Yeah, I, I, you know, and you'll get all kinds of opinions, even veterinarians, of course, may like raw foods. I, again, I have a master's in animal nutrition, so I'm a little more focused on this topic. I do not like raw diets or homemade diets. Raw diets, you wouldn't eat raw chicken or raw Absolutely steak. Absolutely not. Why? Uh, for uh, bacteria, okay. and, and I don't want it moving on my plate yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little raw. Yeah. But no, that's right. Bacterial contamination, the common ones people have heard about, are E. coli poisoning and salmonella. There's a whole host of other things, and I'm going to refer to my notes so I don't forget, uh, that people have probably never heard of. Campylobacter, Listeria, Clostridia, which are nasty bugs that cause the tetanus and botulism. Uh, and then parasites like oh. Toxoplasma, Echinococcus, which is a tapeworm, which is very serious. So there's all kinds of nasty things your pet can get from raw foods if they aren't processed perfectly. And a lot of these stuff, uh, these foodstuffs have been studied not to be processed so perfectly, and they are contaminated with some of these organisms. And the raw food benefits that people tout are so minimal, in my opinion, that it doesn't outweigh the risks. And everything in life is a risk-benefit issue. So the maybe minimal benefits of some raw aspects just don't, don't make up for the potential negatives. There have been documented animal deaths, cats and dogs, from salmonella food poisoning. Now, there's another 
term that has been going around in our industry. Grain free. Everything has to be grain free. Really? Another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Okay. We hit it. All right. So grain free is, in my opinion, the latest gimmick. And I tell my clients, I mean, if your pet's doing great on a certain food, whether it's grain free or not, great. Keep it on that food. But the, one of the issues is potential food allergies, which we're going to have an episode on, uh, that grain free may help somehow with animals that are food allergic. And that is not true. Grains are very, very minimally allergenic. And <sighs> grains like corn, rice, wheat, do you eat that stuff? Yes. Okay, I do too. <laughs> They're great. They're healthy. Yes. Okay. All right, so grain free in some way, shape, or form, some people think it's not good for pets, for cats and dogs. They can digest it fine. Our, our nutritional, our intestinal tracts are 99% identical. We all have stomachs, livers, kidneys, pancreas, all that. And we all digest the same st stuff pretty well. Um, grain free. So what they do is they don't put in corn or wheat or rice which are basically 10% proteins and 90% starches. So what do they do? They substitute, but we'll put in potato. It's not a grain. What is it? It's 10% protein, it's 90% starch. Or we'll put in maybe tapioca, which is about 7% protein and about 93% mm. starch. So they're just supplementing one carbohydrate really for another because it's not a grain. But it's all the same stuff. Oh, and peas. Peas is a big one. Peas might be a little better because peas are a little higher in protein. They're 20% protein, 80% starch. So when they say grain free, it's really meaningless unless your pet has been documented by your vet, in my opinion, to have an issue with that particular substance. And that's very hard to do. It has to be done in a very scientific manner to prove a pet has an allergy or an intolerance to a certain food ingredient. 99% of the pets have no issue with grains. Uh, so the proper procedure would be when we notice some things with our pet, Let's get them to our veterinarian who will conduct a number of tests and you'll tell us what to do. Yeah, and it's not an easy issue. It's a very complex issue, but we'll spend a segment talking about that. Yes. Sounds great. We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I will be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. Mostly related to sand dollars and sea urchins, then let. And some other tests, and then when the results come back. Yeah, we'll talk about the blood tests in another okay. episode. <laughs> but when the when the blood tests come back, then you'll tell us exactly what to do. Uh, not with blood tests. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's let's get another closing here. <laughs> Have you seen Bigfoot? I have not. <laughs> There's a whole other show about that. <laughs> <laughs>Check out My Sun Coast Dining on MySunCoast.com, your guide to the foodie lifestyle. ABC7's own Chef Judy serves up her favorite recipes, cooking tips and trends, dining blog, step-by-step -step videos, and Sun Coast Restaurant Guide. You'll find it all at MySunCoast.com slash dining. Find out first at 4 with ABC7 News at 4, weekdays on ABC7. Get breaking news alerts focused on the Sun Coast. Download the ABC7 News app.